My association with uh, Friedrich A. Taxier has now been going for a little over five years and I've been collaborating with the Bruce Lefroy Centre, which uh, some of you may know. It's the major uh, clinical centre for Friedrich A. Taxia here in, uh, in Australia. Um, and uh, I've been conducting, certainly over the last few years, some research that has been supported by uh, Farah USA and, and Farah Australia as well, so certainly very grateful for that. Actually, I might just say before I get into the, to the meat of the talk or reiterate what Jen said, feel free to interject if you have any questions or comments as I'm going along. If something seems unclear to you, it probably is to other people as well. And uh, so, yes, I'm happy to, to take questions uh, at any time. All right, so just an overview of what we're going to be talking about. I'm, I'm going to talk, obviously, about Friedrich A. Taxia and the way it uh, affects hearing then go on and discuss uh, some possible management options, what we might do about the hearing problems that uh, the people with Friedrichs are facing. And then finally talk a little bit about some of our more recent research, uh, which involves binaural listening, which is a combination of signals between the two ears and uh, some research work that, that Jen's going to be involved in over the next few months. All right, so over, uh, over the last little while, we've tested uh, over 60 individuals here in Australia who have uh, Friedrich ataxia. And virtually everyone that we've seen has had at least some degree of hearing deficit. So in some people, that's, that's relatively severe. They really struggle to understand uh, anything that's said to them, uh, particularly if there's some background noise uh, present. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are some people who on the whole are, are coping quite well with their hearing, but in certain situations uh, have more problems than, uh, than someone who doesn't have Friedrich ataxia. So basically everyone has had at least some, some uh, degree of deficit. Now the problem with Friedrich's is not to do with detection of sound. So this is quite different to the sort of hearing difficulties that we're used to dealing with uh, in the field of audiology, where if the ear itself is damaged, your ability to detect soft sounds is impaired, but that's not the issue with uh, Friedrich ataxia type hearing loss. So sound detection is usually normal, or if not normal, then at least pretty close to it. The issue is to do with the processing of auditory information or the way the signals get from the ear up to, up to the higher centres in the brain, in particular to the auditory cortex. Okay, so the problem then, the ear itself is normal. As I've mentioned, detection of sound is usually fine. There are a range of tests that we can do to make sure that the function of the cells within the ear are, are normal, and they typically are in people who have uh, Friedrich ataxia. The problem with Friedrich's is to do with damage to the auditory nerve and the auditory pathway. So there's uh, axonal loss, so there are fewer neural elements uh, within the auditory pathway than there would normally be, and there's impaired function of the auditory nerve as well. So not only are there less axons there, but the ones that are present tend not to work as efficiently as, as they ought to. Okay, and this, uh, this type of hearing deficit is called auditory neuropathy, which is uh, a relatively recent discovery in the, in the field of uh, hearing science, actually. I mean, the, this, these sorts of issues to do with uh, sensory neural function would be very familiar to all of you guys, I imagine, but the focus of research and, and clinical work... Uh, sorry, was that a no. question there, Jen? I do have a question, Dr. Rams. I apologize. Um, when you said that it was part of the processing to the brain, did, now does that mm -hmm. also have to do with the, the cerebellum because it's, there's, there's been shown to be so much shrinkage in the cerebellum? Or is it strictly mm -hmm. just the processing that from the hearing that goes straight to the brain? Yeah, we yeah. haven't looked at uh, those higher levels, the cerebellum and the cortex specifically in Friedrich's people as yet. The problems that I've been uh, looking for and finding are in the brain stem, so very low levels of the brain. So the auditory nerve itself and the, the brain stem function. So even at those very early stages, as soon as the electrical signal leaves the ear basically, things start to go wrong and the sound gets distorted in various ways. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so this is an auditory neuropathy type deficit, so auditory for hearing and neuropathy meaning the nerve, obviously. Okay, so because the neural uh, function is affected in the auditory pathway, the timing of electrical signals is, uh, is disrupted, so the firing of the nerve or the efficiency of the firing of the nerve is affected. And the perceptual consequence of that is that timing cues within speech are distorted. And it turns out that uh, the speech signal has a lot of information contained in the timing of various uh, sounds. So if that's being affected, as is the case with, uh, with auditory neuropathy in Friedrichs, then you get an overall impairment of the understanding of speech. So I'm just going to talk a little bit now about some of our results to do with speech perception in quiet listening conditions and in background noise. <clears throat> I've got here a little figure for some open set speech perception uh, results. So open set just means the stimuli could be anything. So in the results I'm going to show you now, it's a, it's a word test. So the, the person is presented with a series of words like dog or fish or whatever, and they have to repeat back what, what it is that they've heard. And on this axis here, can you see my cursor there? Jen, are you seeing the arrow on your screen? I'm not seeing the arrow. No? All right, well, on the, on the vertical axis, the y-axis, we have CNC phoneme score. So this is the percentage of phonemes or speech sounds that the listener can discriminate and can repeat back correctly. All right, now on the bottom axis, the x-axis, we have four listening conditions. The one on the left is in quiet, so you're presenting the words on their own. And then there are three other listening conditions, plus 10, plus 5, and 0. So th these are conditions where the speech is presented, but there's different levels of background noise. All right, so plus 10 is where the speech is 10 decibels louder than the noise. Plus 5 is where it's 5 decibels louder. So the further across to the right we go on this graph, the more challenging the listening conditions are, basically. All right, so the pink region here is the expected performance range for people who have normal hearing and normal neural function. So when they're listening in quiet, they're scoring around about 100% correct on this, uh, this word test. And then as the listening conditions become more difficult, the performance starts to fall away such that at 0 dB signal to noise ratio over on the far right, the average score is around about 60%, so they can understand or discriminate 60% of the speech sounds in the stimuli that are being presented. Okay, so the pink area here is the normal range. I have here now the results for uh, all of the people with Friedrich ataxia that we've seen. So if we start on the left, in quiet conditions, the average score is is below the, the expected range uh, or the, the, the range for the control subjects, but pretty close to it. But as we move across to the right, you can see the performance is falling away quite significantly relative to, to normal perception. And if you consider that uh, the signal to noise ratio or the level of speech relative to the noise in your average listening environment, like a classroom or an office or whatever, is around about zero dB, so we're right over here in this region on the right-hand side. You can see that the Friedrichs people that we've tested here in uh, Australia, at least, are really struggling in terms of their perception of speech. If you're only getting 25% of the speech sounds correct on this sort of test, then basically you have very limited capacity to use your hearing in a conversational context. So. So big problems there in terms of functional hearing and particularly in uh, situations where there's background noise. Doctor, this is Don Patel. I have a quick question. Does mm -hmm. it vary depending upon uh, the, from when you were diagnosed? Like it is obviously progressive. So do you have any sense as to how fast that happens? Uh, I do have a sense of that and I have a slide coming up to answer your question actually. So um, it certainly is the case that people early on in the disease process seem to be less affected and, and those who are, are further down the path have more and more problems. Okay, so hearing and disease progression 
then, the, as, as I've just said, the difficulties do appear to, uh, to get worse over time. And we found uh, a strong correlation between um, speech perception performance and the FARS score. Now, are you familiar with the FARS score in the States? Jen, some people know? might be, some people might be, and some might not. Um, but okay. it's it's the score that we give for neurologic function. Yeah, so it's a measure of the overall uh, disability, basically. So. Uh, something that, that obviously gets worse uh, over time. So just to show you ooh, uh, how this looks, we've got on this uh, graph here speech perception in background noise against the FARS score. So on the, the y-axis is, uh, is the FARS. So uh, down at the bottom here around about 20 is a relatively mildly affected person. Uh, someone with a FARS score of 140 or above is, uh, is really uh, very affected in terms of their overall uh, function. On uh, the bottom axis we have the CNC score and you can see that there's uh, a reasonable relationship between um, the scores that people get in on their speech perception testing and how advanced they are or what the overall degree of disability is. So those who are scoring around about 50 to 60 percent, so pretty close to the normal range, tend to be those with a fairly low FARS score. Those who have a high FARS score, there's a whole batch of them here at around about 120, are basically getting no information at all on speech perception when there's, uh, when there's background noise presented. So certainly a relationship there between uh, perceptual ability and, and the overall uh, disease progression. Okay, so that, that's an overview of uh, sort of the, the situation or the functional hearing levels of people with Friedrichs that we've seen. Are there any questions before I move on? Dr. Ress, I have a quick question. Does this um, processing affect their ability to learn and their IQ? Um, no, because we noticed a significant correlation. We noticed that when her hearing, when she was diagnosed with the auditory neuropathy, she seemed to really struggle as far as her school skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, school skills are obviously different to IQ, although uh, some of the IQ tests that are done involve um, uh, being able to understand what's, what's uh, presented to you. Uh, um, so, so I think... If, if you have hearing problems over an extended period, particularly through childhood, then that can affect your speech and language development. Uh, I don't think that's the same as uh, intelligence though, although I, we're sort of getting away from my area a bit here. But certainly school performance uh, can be affected uh, by hearing difficulties. And uh, particularly if in a classroom environment when there's background noise, if the child is not uh, you know, following very well what's being sent to them and not uh, being able to participate fully in the classroom, then that obviously causes uh, all sorts of problems, you know, social difficulties and educational uh, challenges as well. Okay, thank you. I'm just hoping you could um, tell us if there's a solution for this at the end. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, we're, we're moving um, on to management, which is, uh, you know... Dr. Rant? Mm -hmm. Uh, quick question. The previous two graphs, uh, both of them came from the uh, same population of participants? Uh, yes, they did, yeah. Okay, they might be thanks. slightly different subject numbers, but yeah, broadly the same population, yeah. Yeah, the, the reason I was wondering is the uh, the folks that were had FARS scores in the 120, 140, there seemed to be quite a number of them at the zero uh, percent uh, mark. And mm -hmm. sort of remembering back to the first graph, uh, I thought the range was more like five to 20 or 30. Uh, they may be, sorry, they may be slightly different uh, populations because the first study that we did was focusing on people who weren't quite at that uh, that high end of the of the disability range. So okay, so the population they, was different. Well, they they certainly included the same subjects, but the the first graph that I showed you had fewer subjects in it. 
So there were, there you there were go. more in the second one. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would explain what I was seeing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so shall we move on to management then? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we've talked about the fact that uh, that hearing difficulties increase as, as time goes on for people with Friedrich. So certainly regular hearing assessment uh, should be part of the, the management for, for people with, uh, with this disease. And I, I would be recommending reviews perhaps on an annual basis or perhaps every two years at, at, the, at the longest. And the sort of hearing testing that we need to do has to be uh, able to identify the problems that people with Friedrichs have. So as I mentioned, sound detection is, is not the issue typically. So if you just go to your local audiologist and say, I want a hearing test, the, the first uh, assessment that they'll do is an audiogram, which is a test of sound detection. So that, that really doesn't uh, tap into the problem that, uh, that people with an auditory neuropathy type of hearing problem have. So I would recommend that uh, auditory evoked potentials be included in the assessment and these are um, measurements whereby we look at the electrical response of the, the hearing nerves. So there are electrodes attached to the head and sounds presented and you measure the response from the auditory pathway. And certainly auditory evoked potentials are uh, affected through the course of Friedrich's ataxia so that fairly early on you start to see uh, distortion of, uh, of the responses and then in the latter stages the responses are entirely absent. Dr. Rance, mm. is that test uh, uh, readily available in a, uh, a hearing office? It is, yeah. yeah it's part of the okay. standard uh, procedure and it's uh, if you're looking at diagnosing hearing loss in babies, for example, uh, this is you know a standard uh, test technique. But again, the audiologist that you're seeing needs to uh, to know that this sort of test is appropriate. It's not done routinely in adult subjects who just show up saying, you know, I've got some hearing problems. The the first test for an audiologist to do, or the main assessment, is just sound uh, detection. Mm -hmm. And if the if working with Friedrich's people has taught us anything, it's it's that detection of sound is really just the start of the process. The the, uh, the things that go wrong in, in people with Friedrich's are, are further down the down the track in the auditory the central auditory system itself. All right, and uh, so obviously speech perception in background noise is an important part of the hearing assessment as well because uh, you know that's the the functional aspect of, uh, of hearing and what's uh, important in terms of uh, people's day-to-day -day lives and their general communication. All right, listening tactics are also uh, important, uh, important things to consider um, for people with Friedrich's ataxia. So uh, these are things that you might like to be thinking about uh, when you're communicating in the home or with children in the school environment. And they're fairly basic sort of obvious things like uh, minimising background noise as much as possible. So if you're having an important conversation with uh, with your child who has Friedrichs, then you know turn off the television in the background or make sure that there there's as little uh, other noisy things going on as possible um, when you're having your your communication or your interaction. You might also want to think about uh, structuring the communication environment as much as much as you can so that you optimize visual cues so that uh, lip reading cues are uh, available as well as uh, as well as the auditory signal and other things like if you're talking to someone with Friedrichs uh, don't sit or stand with your back to a window because if there's a strong light behind you then it's very hard to, to see the face and to, to get these visual, visual cues while you're communicating. Okay, and the other important thing is that uh, there should be an awareness of potential communication problems and I think this is particularly uh, relevant to, uh, to children because one of the things that happens in classroom with all children who have hearing problems is that they become disconnected when they can't hear what the teacher is saying and follow what's going on and that can often manifest as behavioural problems. So certainly if, uh, if you have a child in school who uh, has Friedrich ataxia then you want to be making the teachers aware that there are uh, potential hearing and communication uh, problems there. 
Okay, so the final aspect here of uh, management I want to talk about is uh, hearing devices. So uh, what, uh, what devices we might put into play. Uh, the first is uh, conventional amplification or hearing aids. Now uh, these are really not appropriate for an auditory neuropathy or a Friedrich's ataxia related hearing difficulty because they're not designed to fix the problems that uh, people with Friedrich ataxia have. Uh, all that conventional hearing aids do is make sounds louder basically. So they don't improve the clarity of the signal, they can't uh, fix the distortion that's uh, occurring uh, within the neural system. Uh, and basically what you end up with is, is a loud distorted signal rather than one at, at a normal level. Okay, so conventional hearing aids really not appropriate for, for this group. Now here in Melbourne we are currently working on uh, a new type of hearing aid which is based on uh, the cochlear implant technology actually. It's called a digital speech processing hearing aid. So the idea here is that the signal is actually modified in some way so that it can um, address the particular perceptual problems that people with Friedrich ataxia have. So you're manipulating the speech signal to make uh, particularly timing cues more obvious and we're optimistic that this is going to in the future provide uh, a good listening option for people with a, an auditory neuropathy type hearing loss but, but this is still a little way away. We, we're starting some trials uh, in the next couple of months so you know, optimistically a commercial device is, is going to be available perhaps in a, a year or two. All right, so a device though that uh, is available at the moment is an FM listening system. So I wanted to talk in a bit of detail about these because we have uh, we've we've done a trial here in Melbourne over the last couple. Doctor Rance. Hmm. Doctor Rance. Um, uh, I see that you're going on into FM listening systems, hearing aid systems. Uh, my daughter, who is a uh, a late stage FAer and a young man uh, who has since passed on but was also a late stage affair. Uh, both of them of course exhibited everything that you're talking about. Uh, they went, each of them went and got similar but different hearing aids and both of them reported, reported immediately that their, their general hearing was improved immensely mm -hmm. and one of the difficulties uh, and this at the same time with my daughter at least that if I'm one on one with her uh, in a quiet room uh, and of course I'm not particularly a soft spoken person uh, mm -hmm. but others as well that she seemed to be able to hear fairly well to good with them and certainly if it was in a high noise environment, it, you know, it was very bad. But both of them immediately after they got their hearing aids, my daughter went outside the hearing office and suddenly could hear someone uh, 50 feet away uh, having a conversation and she remarked that she could not hear that. The young man was at his home and right after and ask his mother, what's that noise? What's that noise? And it turned out to be the sound of his mouse clicking that he had completely lost. So those are not high background noise things, both with relatively low noise environment. So how do you, how do you split uh, those two effects? And I guess in testing where you can, because I, I had discounted very strongly the uh, applicability of a, a hearing aid, especially because it was three thousand um, dollars, and and in in the direction of it's a high noise problem, but all of a sudden both of these later stage uh, FAers got a lot of benefit out of it. Mm, well. I'm interested that you say that because uh, certainly in the literature, you know, there's been there've been consistent reports that hearing aids are not successful with this type of hearing loss. 
and that's definitely been our that's been our experience here in Melbourne as well. So I'm just thinking about how it is that they might be better off if they were fit with a hearing aid, and I wonder what the sound detection of of these two people were like, because that's really the only thing that can be improved by a conventional hearing aid. So if your daughter and this this other fellow were struggling to hear soft sounds, if their audiogram was abnormal, then a hearing aid is going to amplify the sound and give them access to soft signals like the mouse click and so forth. Well, my daughter, for instance, my, my daughter tested in the, the low normal range mm. with the with the listening, you know, the normal uh, uh, test. Uh, of course, she later told me that she cheated because uh, on some of the tests she could lip read what the person was saying through the window, right. uh -huh. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. but, but she did test in a low normal range, so that, that's a bit of a conundrum for me. So. Yeah, yeah, well, again, I'm interested that you say that because it certainly hasn't been our experience. Uh, and, you know, we've given it a good try. Um, with you know perhaps a couple of hundred uh, people with auditory neuropathies here in Melbourne over the last couple of decades, and uh, yeah, adults on the whole have tended uh, to be very unenthusiastic about uh, conventional amplification. But it, it sounds like in some circumstances it might be a possibility. All right, are there any other questions uh, about hearing aids or? Okay, well let's let's move on then, and we'll talk about uh, FM listening systems. So, these are devices that are specifically improved or designed to improve uh, listening in background noise, and they've been used quite extensively for quite a long time in uh, in children and adults who have a typical ear-related type hearing loss. So the way they work is uh, basically the speaker, uh, which is usually a teacher, these are typically worn in a classroom environment, the speaker wears a microphone attached to the lapel or on a string around the neck and the speaker's voice is, uh, is picked up by this microphone and then transmitted via radio waves to ear level receivers that are worn by the listener. So the advantage is that basically it's as if the speaker is only uh, 12 inches away from the, the child or the listener's ear or wherever they are in the classroom. So even if they're at a distance, it's as if the speaker is quite close to them. Okay, so it's able to present speech at a comparatively loud level relative to the background noise. So it increases the, the signal to noise ratio that I was talking about earlier. So we did a study uh, with some devices that were donated by Phonak, which is a, a hearing uh, device company uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, so here's, here's a picture of, uh, of, of what it looks like. So the fellow here on the left is wearing the, the microphone attached to his shirt. And on the right here, these are the ear level receivers. So they're, they're quite uh, small and the trend in this sort of technology is to make it uh, smaller and smaller so that it's uh, it's uh, you know, less cosmetically uh, obvious, particularly uh, an issue with getting you know, teenage children to wear them. Uh, this is, has in fact created some problems for uh, some of the Friedrich ataxia people that we've seen, because as you would know, they, they can have uh, significant fine motor problems. So dealing with these tiny little earpieces can be a challenge, but uh, there are certainly ways around that as well. But, but this is the device that, uh, that we used in the trial. All right, so I've got some results here. Again, it's uh, the CNC phoneme score, which is their speech perception score, the number of speech or percentage of speech sounds that they could correctly identify. There were 10 subjects who participated in this trial. They're all listed uh, along the bottom axis here. So the white bars in each case are the speech perception score in the unaided condition. All right, so they're not wearing the device at, at this stage. So you can see the performance levels there. And then the filled bars, the blue ones, are the speech perception scores that they were able to achieve when they were wearing the listening devices. And you can see that in virtually every case, number eight was a bit of an exception, but in all of the others, there was a significant improvement in their uh, perception of speech in background noise when they were wearing this device. 
Okay, so certainly a, a positive result there, at least uh, within the laboratory when we were doing this formal speech perception testing. So as part of this trial, we also um, had a take-home period. So they, they wore the device at home for, uh, for six weeks and they were wearing it for periods of across this six week period they would they would wear it for two weeks and then not wear it for two weeks and then back on for two weeks and after the end of each one of these phases they filled out a uh, a hearing and communication survey which is called the AFAB and uh, I've just got some results here for that um, now the way this test works is it's divided the questions are divided into various uh, sections so we have questions about their general uh, ease of communication how they can cope in a, a range of communication uh, situations uh, how they deal with uh, listening in background noise uh, how they go in reverberant environments this is uh, situations where there might be uh, uh, a significant echo occurring so if you're in the bathroom for example there's, there's a fair amount of uh, bouncing off the walls of the sound so a highly reverberant environment uh, the, the survey also looks at aversiveness to sound so how people cope with uh, loud sounds and then there's a total score so the other axis here is perceived difficulty which is the percentage of situations in which the subject or the person filling out the, the uh, survey feels they have a significant disability or significant problems. So if you do this survey in people who have normal hearing and, uh, and a normal auditory pathway, they're typically scoring less than 10% on all of, these, uh, all of these measures, communication, noise, reverberation and so on. Right, so you can see here that our people with Friedrich ataxia are reporting themselves that they're having significant problems, particularly in the case of background noise where our subjects were saying in 50% of occasions or half of the situations that they find themselves in, they really struggle with, uh, with listening in noise. All right, so these unfilled bars are uh, the way they rated their own listening and communication ability in the unaided condition, so this is just not wearing the device in, in daily life. And if we compare that with when they are wearing an FM system, you see that for the most part these bars are getting smaller, which means that their perceived difficulty is reducing. And this is particularly the case for uh, their ability to communicate and the way they were coping with background noise and reverberant environments. So certainly another good result there suggesting that uh, the particip participants themselves were saying yes they can listen and communicate much better when they're wearing these, these devices. Alright so the conclusions then uh, it does seem that these systems are able to improve listening and general communication in background noise for people who have, uh, have Freevix. There were some limitations though um, as I've mentioned, wearing an FM system is best suited to a structured listening situation such as a classroom because uh, there's only one person can wear the microphone at a time. So if you imagine a, a social situation where lots of people are sitting down to dinner, for example, uh, it can become quite awkward to be passing the microphone from person to person uh, so that the, the listener can, can uh, hear the signal clearly. So it's certainly better for a, a structured sort of situation where there's one person who's doing most of the, the talking. As I've also mentioned, we've we had a few hardware issues with the devices being small and difficult to manipulate, although we've managed to get around most of those by, uh, by adjusting the, the type of uh, headsets that people were wearing. And the other issue is expense and we touched on that a little earlier when you're talking about how much uh, hearing aids cost. Um, we've managed to convince the authorities here in Australia to provide these devices free of charge at least to children who have Friedrich's ataxia. I'm not sure what the situation would be in the US but uh, I suspect it's probably not as generous. Um, in most respects uh, getting uh, government funding for hearing devices here in Australia is, is pretty easy relative to other countries around the world. And the, the devices uh, that we used in the trial, they cost about three to four thousand dollars. There are other versions which I imagine would work just as well that may be a bit cheaper but it's, it's still a significant expense. 
All right, so uh, that, that concludes the, the information I wanted to present on uh, management of hearing difficulties. Are there any questions before we move on? All right, yeah. well in that case... It's I, hmm? I just wanted to do, um, say one thing, because like, I'm a, I would consider myself a lead essayer. You know, I've had it for 20 years, but the, my the listening problem that that I see as a challenge is what is now being addressed through these implants and these hearing devices. And it's not only me, it's other SAers. And what I think is a big problem that really needs to be looked at is the processing of the actual information. Like um, Paul was saying earlier, his daughter, if she talks one-on-one, -on -one, and that's like me, myself. If I talk one-on-one, -on -one, and so you're focusing so much on hearing that you'll understand. Well, in a group setting, when you have so many people talking, you don't know which way to focus, and there's so much to focus on that it's not necessarily the hearing, but it's more as the understanding of what they say. Mm. And that seems to be a, a big problem, I know, with a, a lot of essayers and myself. Yes, well, I think you're right. We've certainly had similar reports from uh, from the people here in Australia. Just the fact that it requires so much effort to follow uh, conversation, for example, in background noise, that it just uh, it becomes exhausting. So you're having to deal with the the fatigue as well as everything else of uh, of having to to really concentrate so hard in those sorts of situations. And and again, it's all just due to the fact that. The signal that's passing from the ear up to the brain is being distorted. So, um, you know, what you're hearing in that sort of situation is less clear, and so you have to employ other strategies, and uh, and these all require effort. And uh, you know, I can see that um, people by the by the end of the day are really struggling with fatigue as much as anything else. Has anybody looked at perhaps is there any type of like rewiring of that, you know, of the neurotransmitters from the ear to get to where they can go properly to, to help process, because I'm sure that's what a lot of the problem is for the young kids in school, because it wasn't until recently, I always thought that I just did not like movies and television. Until I was at another FAer's house, and I saw them watching TV with the captions, and I was like, I never tried that, but I was able to sit and watch and enjoy the movie with the captions on the TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, to, to answer your question, uh, there hasn't been any work done on rewiring the neural system, and I can't see any progress being made on that. Uh, front anytime soon. All of the focus at the moment is on trying to make the signal that is presented to the person's auditory system as clear as possible. And that's where I was talking before about the hearing devices that we're working on which try and emphasize the particular uh, problems in the, in the signal. Uh, and make them more obvious so that when they do pass up through the auditory system there's a better chance of, of being able to hear the differences between between different sounds. Um, now I think you, perhaps it was you who mentioned earlier cochlear implants and whether uh, whether that might be a good approach for people with Friedrichs, is that right? Yes, uh, my son has uh, a cochlear implant Mm. And they, he got it with no guarantees for sure. They mm -hmm. said, we don't know if this will work, but he wanted to try it. And he has noticed an improvement. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that. Uh, there haven't been a lot of uh, results for cochlear implant in Friedrich's people reported in the literature so far. Um, the ones that have have, have been a bit uh, equivocal. There have been some problems reported. And the difficulty with a cochlear implant is that basically an implant replaces the function of the cochlea or the ear itself. So the signal from the cochlear implant still has to pass up through the neural system, which is where the problem is for people with Friedrichs. But I think there are some reasons to be slightly optimistic about what a cochlear implant might do for someone who has Friedrich ataxia, just to do with the way that the signal is processed. Because the problem that the people with Friedrichs have is to do with disruption of the timing of the electrical signals through the auditory pathway. And the signal provided by a cochlear implant is in the form of a series of electrical pulses which kind of force the nerve to fire uh, at the right time, if you like. So it may be that the the, just the way the cochlear implant presents sound might be a more efficient way of stimulating the auditory pathway than an acoustic signal coming from a hearing device, for example. So I think in that sense there's some uh, some potential for for optimism there, but we need to be a little bit careful about uh, about cochlear implantation in in people who have uh, an auditory neuropathy or who have Friedrich ataxia. Shall we move on then to uh, to binaural processing? Okay, so so that this is. Uh, a binaural just means uh, two ears, so it's it's listening with two ears, which is obviously our natural listening condition for, for most people at least. And having uh, two ears provides us with a number of advantages in terms of uh, listening in the environment because we can compare subtle differences in the signal reaching each ear to tell us things about particularly the direction from which sounds are coming. So we use uh, binaural processing to judge sound direction or localization. So if you imagine, for example, uh, if there's a sound source on your right and the, the sound is, is coming towards you, it's going to reach your right ear slightly before it gets to your left ear. And this very slight timing difference between the signal of the two ears is what we use to tell us that the sound is actually coming from, from the right hand side. And we also use this localization ability in terms of our speech understanding for when we're trying to pick out a particular speaker within the background noise. So if the person who is speaking to you is, uh, or if the sound is coming from a slightly different direction from most of the background noise, we can use that directionality to, to be able to focus on the particular speaker within, within the, uh, the background signal. So it's actually quite important in terms of understanding speech in a, in a natural listening environment. Okay, now the, uh, the comparisons of the signal between the two ears actually occur at the neural level. They occur at the level of, uh, of the brain stem. And not surprisingly, binaural processing seems to be impaired in people who have a Friedrich ataxia type hearing loss because they can't effectively combine the signal coming from the left and the right auditory nerves. Again, because the timing of the neural firing in each ear or from each ear is, is being distorted. Okay, so this is just uh, yet another problem that people with, uh, with Friedrichs have in terms of their listening and understanding in everyday life. Okay, the, an, an inability to effectively combine speech signals between the two ears. So just recently we've been doing some uh, testing to, to look at the degree of the, the problem here using uh, a new test called the Listen S, which is the Listening in Spatialized Noise Test. Now I'll spare you the details of, of how this all works, but basically it's measuring a spatial advantage. So how much better they can hear when they're able to combine the signal from two ears compared to if the signal uh, was just going to one ear or if they're getting the same signal in both ears. 
So on this figure here I have spatial advantage on, on the uh, vertical axis there and results for control subjects, the white bar, and Friedrich ataxia subjects, the, the blue bar there. So the control subjects in fact obtained an advantage of around about 12 decibels by virtue of the fact that they could effectively compa uh, compare the signals and combine the signals being presented to the, the two ears. Whereas you can see in the Friedrichs case they were less able to combine the two signals and had a, a spatial disadvantage there if you like. Okay, so overall people with Friedrich ataxia are less able to, uh, to use binaural processing or the information uh, presented to the two ears. And if we look at again uh, some results here comparing the spatial advantage uh, test uh, from the Listen S with their FARS score, you can see here that there's actually quite a tight correlation here between the ability to again combine uh, signals coming from the two ears and the overall level of dis disability, the FARS score. And it's this tight correlation between the, the, uh, the results that we're getting from the auditory pathway and the overall disability level that make us think this might be a good uh, biomarker or a good clinical measure that could be used to track disease progress in people who have Friedrich ataxia and perhaps uh, be suitable for use in, uh, in some of the intervention studies as, as a, uh, one of the measures that are used to see if, uh, if the, the, uh, the drug trials are being uh, successful. Okay, so we have a relatively small number of subjects uh, tested here in Melbourne, but the plan this year is to do some further testing uh, over there in the States. And I think Jen is uh, coordinating this. Um, so basically what we're going to do is repeat the pilot work that we've done in Australia in hopefully a couple of hundred uh, people with Friedrich ataxia and see if this correlation is, is the same in the results that you're getting over there. If, if there is in fact a close relationship between this particular measure of auditory function and overall disease progress and again with a view to perhaps using it as a, a biomarker for the, the various uh, trials. All right, so that, that uh, concludes my presentation. Uh, I wonder, are there any more questions that, uh, or issues that you'd like to address? Very, thank you very much. I have, uh -huh. I have one question I'd like to ask. And um, at the very end, um, when you talk about the binaural processing and, and the ability to test that with the, with the listen S system, um, it implies that we're hopeful that some of the um, coming treatments for SA that, that might improve um, neurologic function might also improve hearing as well. Um, can you, it, it might, I, I, um, is there evidence about the hearing system's ability to recover or what about the hearing problem makes us hopeful that we might be able to improve it if we were to, um, you know, start increasing for taxin levels in people or, you know, mm. be able to stop the progression of the disease? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I think there isn't any uh, evidence at the moment that, uh, that we might be able to improve hearing in an auditory neuropathy type of hearing loss. The Friedrichs field is, is uh, you know, quite a way ahead of uh, lots of others, as you would know, Jen, in terms of uh, uh, pharmacological intervention. So I'm, I'm really interested to see whether uh, there is a possibility to improve neural function in the auditory system. It certainly hasn't yet been demonstrated in any of the other forms of auditory neuropathy that have, uh, okay. that have uh, been looked at so far. Dr. Rance, um, Tinnitus, a number of FAers that I'm around uh, have complained and, and asked about tinnitus and uh, its connection with FA and what, what can they do about it? Mm, well, that's a good question. I, I hadn't, in fact, uh, heard that, uh, that tinnitus was associated with, with, with FA. I'm not surprised to hear it. Um, there are certainly... Uh, 
uh, evidence from other quarters that suggest that disrupted neural firing can be a, a particular form of, uh, of, of tinnitus. Um, I'd have to give that some thought and, and, uh, and get back to you on it. I, I'm, I'm really not sure um, how to answer it. I mean, generally, tinnitus is a, a difficult uh, uh, issue to address from whatever the source is. And most approaches have, uh, have looked at uh, trying to mask the signal with providing other sorts of things to listen to. Um, yeah, but I, it's sort of, again, it's a bit out of my, uh, my area, but uh, certainly something to think about. Well, and I'm with Jen Farmer was saying, um, it had me thinking this same thing with all these new drugs to increase the frac taxing. Um, I know, I can guarantee you that it is going to bring back some audio back within us and the problems that we were having because as of now, um, when, when an FA is tired or or when it's just nighttime and it's a light and it's not lit up or after you eat, everything is harder. Talking, walking, listening, anything you do is hard. But when you first get up in the morning and you're not tired after you get up and stretch, you're at your bed. And you can hear much better. You can speak much better. So if we can increase the frectaxin in our bodies and our listening is going to improve temples probably. Um, my question and concern is why should Sarah, you know, I don't, you know, I'm thinking, why is everybody wasting their research dollars and trying to help on the ear implant when take that money and push these drugs and these tri trials that are going to actually hit the problem and not just maybe help the problem temporarily? Mary, that's that's a good question. I appreciate it. Um, I, I think one very important thing that we're learning from the hearing studies is how how the auditory nerve is impacted, and that's sort of a a smaller scale as well for the rest of the nervous system. And to be able to measure change in people, whether it's um, change in walking, change in hand coordination, or change in hearing um, is part of what we have to do, and we have to validate these measures um, to to be able to know whether or not drugs that we're going to try in clinical trials are going to be helpful. And we need tests that are helpful at all stages of the disease, and so. Um, we need tests at early stages. So, you know, some of the hearing tests, we, some of the tests like walking is helpful at early stages, but at late stages of the disease is not. The peg board test that we do is helpful at early stages of the disease, but not at later stages. Um, same thing is true with the, the FARS exam. It has, it has both a floor and a ceiling in that Again, it's not very helpful at the early stages or the late stages. And so we need measures that are continuous over the course of the disease that allow us to measure change. And these hearing tests from some of the graphs that Dr. Rance was showing us um, tell us that this could potentially be the kind of test that's more continuous over the course of the disease and allows sensitivity at both ends of the spectrum early and late if we're able to detect changes in people who are mildly affected and still able to detect changes in people who are at later stages of the disease. Um, so 
you know, having these kinds of measures are are very important to our ability to bring drugs and treatments forward. Um, if we're not able to test them effectively in a wide group of people, um, we're not going to be able to effectively bring those drugs forward. So it, it's part of the process. Um, the other thing is that, you know, while we're working on the treatments, um, we still need to come up with symptomatic therapies as well. Um, stopping the disease, you know, we don't know for sure that it's going to reverse the changes in hearing. And so we're also going to benefit if we can find better ways for people to cope with damage that might have already been done. Thank you, Jen. I know just by listening to you talk, it helped clarify a lot, whereas like I see the need for a standardized test, being that when you give us, you know, drug trials, you ha have measure, you have something that you can measure, so then you can take it to the FDA. Yep. And you have backup now. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, hearing is something that they recognize as a meaningful outcome. Right. Um, directly related to quality of life. And so it, it could be a very good measure for us. I have a question for Dr. Rance. Did any of those patients in the studies in the graph that you showed that had hearing loss, did any of them have visual impairment as well? Um, that that wasn't specifically included in the study, uh, but there certainly have been other studies using the same patients uh, who have shown visual issues as well, visual and vestibular problems as well, so affect on their balance and so forth. Is there any correlation between the visual loss and hearing loss? Mm, no, we, we haven't tried that, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if, uh, if that was the case. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Certainly with other uh, mitochondrial diseases that we've been looking at, there have been correlations between degrees of visual deficit and auditory deficit as well. This is John Mattello. I just up, but I want to thank everybody for being on the call, and certainly Doctor for the for the presentation. I greatly appreciate it and the opportunity to hear it. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure. Okay, thanks a lot, all. Bye. Mm -hmm. um, may I say something? This is Jean Trot. Um, I wanted to say that before Tony considered his cochlear implant, he and Matt both went to uh, Wilmington to take part in the work that's being done there by uh, Dr. Thierry Morlet and his wife, and um, they, you know, they did a very thorough hearing testing, and I, I would, I don't think they're getting the number of, of subjects that they need to move the study forward. Um, I, I don't know how we can encourage people to be in touch with them and take part in that, but I think it would be a good idea. Dean, this is Paul. Um, if you would uh, put a posting into FAPG like once a month or once every six weeks to remind people and encourage people. I, I think that would hit almost 600 uh, folks in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, that would be a good start. Okay. That's a good idea. Jean, you're, you're absolutely right. We had, um, we had also tried to get more folks to go to Delaware. Um, Dr. Morlett was doing the same studies that Dr. Rance was doing. They were, um, you know, put together the same list of the same list of tests to do in, in folks. And, um, you know, we just, I don't know if it's the location, Wilmington, Delaware was harder for people to get to or um, even when they came to Philadelphia for, you know, annual visits here, it was still difficult to get them to, to also go to Delaware, and that's in part why um, we've now got a much more portable device um, that we're going to be able to use in the clinics 
um, that I'm going to start um, piloting in the next in the next few weeks. And so hopefully we can make some of the hearing assessments and some of these studies a little bit more accessible to people. That's great. That's wonderful. There any other questions? All right. Well, Dr. Rance, thank you very much. Um, that was a really great overview of the hearing studies that, that you've done and where the progress is and, and where we're going with um, with this work. We we really appreciate it, and we appreciate you taking the time to, to do this webinar for us today. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a pleasure, Jane, and here, here. thank you all for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you.